beautiful serene lake sheltered by lush forests. A tall, symmetrical, snow-capped peak dominating the skyline. A mountain graced with the beauty of geologic youth. These are the memories of Mount St. Helens, landmarks of the Pacific Northwest, forever changed by one of the most cataclysmic events witnessed on the North American continent, an explosive volcanic eruption. The sleeping mountain awakes. began. According to data received by the permanent U.S. Geological Survey seismograph station in Newport, Washington. From March 20th until March 26th, the Newport station recorded more than 30 tremors that ranged in magnitude from 3.4 to 4.2. Most of these and hundreds of smaller quakes were centered near the volcano at relatively shallow depths of about three miles or less below the land surface. To obtain more detailed information about the location and depth of the earthquakes, seismologists of the survey and the University of Washington began collaborating on March 21st to expand an existing field network of both telemetered and portable seismographs. Because earthquakes may be related to the underground movement of magma or molten rock, information on changes in the locations or depths of the earthquakes can be useful in determining if, when, and where magma may be moving upward toward the surface. Survey scientists flying over the volcano on March 24th were unable to detect obvious signs of increased volcanic or new thermal activity, such as steaming areas or newly melted bear patches in the snow. But they did report a number of snow avalanches triggered by the earthquakes. A sharp increase in the magnitudes and frequency of earthquakes on March 25th prompted the chief spokesman for the survey investigations to leave immediately from Denver for the command post established at the Gifford Pinchot National Forest Headquarters in Vancouver, Washington. Early on March 27th, before the first eruptive outburst was reported, the survey began issuing a formal hazard alert to more than 30 state and local officials, representatives of other federal agencies, and the local congressional delegation. The first eruption occurred during the afternoon of March 27th, when the volcano explosively ejected a volume of ash and steam. Although the volcano was under an extensive cloud cover, the time of the first eruption was probably marked by a loud boom, as reported by the U.S. Forest Service, at about 12.36 p.m. The Survey Newport Station recorded a magnitude 4.5 earthquake, the strongest up to that point, at 2.01 p.m. During overflight shortly afterwards, Survey and Forest Service observers saw a new crater about 200 to 250 feet in diameter and 150 feet deep. More scientists began arriving at the volcano from survey offices to monitor the volcano, assess the potential hazards to surrounding areas, and to conduct a wide range of scientific observations of its activity. These included 
aerial and ground-based observations, and instrumental monitoring of earthquake activity, deformation of the ground surface, gravity changes, the physical and chemical compositions of volcanic ash and gases, thermal emissions, and changes in the quantity and quality of water runoff. A second explosion occurred at about 3 a.m. March 28th and produced an ash and steam cloud that rose more than a mile above the volcano as well as an ash avalanche that cascaded down its east edge. By mid-afternoon, at least a dozen explosions had occurred and columns of steam and ash had reached nearly 10,000 feet above the volcano and had drifted eastward. Vents near the volcano's summit were emitting volcanic ash, steam, and other gases. Earthquake activity continued, which appeared to be centered beneath the northwestern part of the volcano at a depth of less than one mile. Several ash-laden snow avalanches moved down the east flank of the volcano, a few reaching the 6,400-foot level of the mountain. As a precautionary measure, Pacific Power and Light officials lowered the water level in Swift Reservoir by at least 24 feet to create capacity to accommodate any eruption-induced snowmelt runoff or mud flows. By March 29th, a second crater was noted within the old summit crater, and during the night, the first observations were made of a blue flame burning within the craters and of lightning flashes accompanying ash avalanches. Survey scientists speculated that the ground-hugging lightning bolts, some nearly two miles long, were caused by particles rubbing together in the mass of ash to produce electrostatic discharges, much like the static electricity sometimes generated by walking over a rug. The first survey analyses of ash samples found no evidence of juvenile or new rock material that would indicate a magmatic eruption to be underway. The ash was composed of pulverized old rock ejected into the air by steam explosions. The explosive eruptions were thought to be caused by subsurface water within the volcano that trickled down through the rocks and when heated to the temperature of boiling, expanded violently in a sudden burst of steam. The survey established the first tilt meter station to measure surface deformation that might be caused by swelling of the volcano as magma moved upward. The frequency of the earthquakes lessened somewhat, but the average magnitude increased, suggesting that total energy release remained more or less the same. The first weak burst of harmonic tremor was noted from 7.25 to 7.30 p.m. on April 1st. The harmonic tremor, a continuous release of seismic energy, in contrast to the distinct energy bursts of discrete earthquakes, is typically associated with the underground movement of magma. All recent volcanic eruptions in Hawaii, for example, have been preceded and accompanied by harmonic tremor. But such tremor also sometimes occurs without being followed by an eruption. A second stronger burst of harmonic tremor was recorded by many seismographs in the region from 7.40 to 7.55 p.m. on April 2nd. This second burst confirmed the recognition of the weaker harmonic tremor the day before and provided the best indication to date that magma was moving beneath Mount St. Helens. Survey scientists alerted state and local officials to a heightened concern as part of a hazard watch system. By April 8th, the two new craters had become a single large crater, which later continued to enlarge by explosions, subsidence, and slumping to attain an overall size of as much as 1,700 feet across and 850 feet deep. This crater continued to contain all of the eruptive vents. During the last week of April, survey mappers were able to confirm earlier estimates that parts of the upper north flank of the volcano had moved up or out at least 270 feet since the beginning of seismic and eruptive activity. 
survey scientists announced on April 30th that the North Slope bulge then represented the most serious potential hazard posed by current volcanic activity at Mount St. Helens. More detailed geodetic monitoring had been able to detect an average lateral displacement of about five feet per day on parts of the North Slope that included the bulge and the Goat Rocks area. Scientists interpreted the bulging to reflect swelling from the upward movement of liquid magma into the volcano. Because of the instability of the North Slope and related potential hazards of large avalanches of snow, ice, and rock that could disrupt Highway 504 south and west of Spirit Lake, the survey issued an updated hazard warning to state and local officials and to the U.S. Forest Service on April 30th, 1980. peeled away from the volcano as a large vertical cloud began to rise from the summit. The tephra cloud rose very rapidly to more than 10 miles above sea level, passing through the tropopause at 7 miles. Winds blew the clouds to the east. Ashfall at Yakima, Washington, 90 miles away, totaled as much as 4 to 5 inches and caused respiratory problems for some residents. By mid-afternoon, the ash had reached Spokane, reducing visibility to only 10 feet, although only half an inch was deposited there. Almost two inches of ash were reported from areas of Montana west to the Continental Divide, but only a dusting fell on the eastern slopes. Slight ashfall occurred in Denver on May 19th. The ash blew generally eastward for the next several days, causing some problems for aircraft over the Midwest. The survey identified three components of the initial eruptive event, in addition to the vertical cloud. A directed blast leveled the forest on the north and the northwest flanks for a distance of up to 15 miles from the former summit. The blast swept over ridges and flowed down valleys, depositing significant quantities of ash. Although the blast was hot, it did not char fallen or bury trees. Many persons are known to have been killed by the blast, and others in the devastated zone are still missing. The second component was a combined pyroclastic flow and landslide that carried the remnants of the north flank uplift across the lower slopes and about 17 miles down the Toodle River Valley, burying it to depths as much as 180 feet. Large quantities of mud, logs, and other debris clogged several valleys around Mount St. Helens and rendered some shipping lanes impassable in the Columbia River. The third component was a pumiceous pyroclastic flow funneled northward through the breach formed by the destruction of the north flank bulge. This flow dammed the outlet of Spirit Lake, trapping a large quantity of water. The volcano maintained an eruption column 10 miles high until a relatively sudden diminution of activity occurred in the early morning of May 19th. The altitude of the top of the column declined to about two and a half miles. Activity continued to weaken through May 22nd. A new elliptical crater about a quarter of a mile deep had been formed by the explosion. Preliminary analyses of seismic and deformation data indicates that there was no immediate warning of the imminence of a large explosion. A magnitude 5.0 earthquake occurred essentially simultaneously with the explosion at 8.32 a.m. Records of the only surviving tilt meter on the south flank show that rapid inflation began at the same time as the explosion at 8.32 a.m. Although volume estimates for this eruption are very rough, 
Comparison with previous eruptions in the Smithsonian Institution's volcanic reference file indicates that explosions of this size occur only once every decade. Dr. Donald Swanson of the U.S. Geological Survey Office in Vancouver, Washington, explains what the geologists have learned from the eruptions at Mount St. Helens. Well, that's very hard to say in, in just a few words because we've learned so much uh, about how St. Helens behaves and about how the, the populace around St. Helens operates, too. Uh, regarding the mountain, we've, we've really seen an episode of, of repeated, or uh, I should say repeated episodes of activity, all of which have been rather similar. And this has given us a real chance to delve into exactly what's causing this kind of, rep of uh, repeated behavior. Uh, it's also been very interesting to me to see the reaction of the local inhabitants, who at first were fearful of the mountain, and uh, subsequently many of, of whom have changed their minds and now want to get as close to the mountain as they possibly can. So you've seen some actual psychological changes in these people? I believe there has. I'm not, a, I'm not a sociologist, so I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I, I, I think that that has, uh, has indeed happened. What uh, specifically, if you could name two or three important discoveries, what, what would you say those would be? Probably the most important discovery that we've made is that we've developed a technique for predicting the kinds of eruptions that we've been having. And we've been, we've been very successful at that using a combination of, of seismic um, ground deformation and gas monitoring. Uh, aside from that, we've, we've been learning about how a single batch of, of magma um, evolves or doesn't evolve with time. And I also we've been learning, I think, well, we've been able to use the techniques that we've been experimenting with at St. Helens uh, on other volcanoes. And I think the chances of our using the techniques successfully on other volcanoes in the future will be quite high. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the specific instrumentation and devices that you might uh, use in studying the volcanoes? Yeah, there are a number of seismometers uh, on the volcano and very near the volcano that monitor the seismicity. And uh, this study, which is conducted primarily by the University of Washington in, in collaboration with us, shows that the amount of earthquakes and the, the kinds of earthquakes change before eruptions. And so the seismicity is probably our single best guide toward anticipating eruptions. Secondly, we, we measure uh, deformation of the cr uh, crater floor and of the dome itself using various surveying techniques, a laser ranging instrument, a theodolite for measuring vertical angles, a uh, tilt meter, an electronic device that measures ground tilt. And these also show accelerated rates of deformation or, or movements prior to eruptions. There's another technique that's been used quite successfully at times, and that is uh, the uh, airborne monitoring of gases given off from the volcano, primarily sulfur dioxide. This has shown elevated levels of sulfur dioxide several times that have correlated with the start or even with precursors to eruptions. Finally, um, one of our staff is experimenting with studies at night of the uh, thermal properties of the lava dome that's growing in the crater. And from this, he's able to see the development of new radial cracks on the dome itself prior to eruptions. So these are some of the techniques that we've been using most successfully. There are a number of others that people have been experimenting with but probably the ones that I've mentioned are the most useful for predictions. I understand you've been working very closely with the, the dome formation. You've been observing that. Uh, how fast does that dome grow? The dome is stagnant for long periods of time, and it's just, it just slowly settles and subsides, uh, really because its core is mobile and it's just sagging under its own weight. But then a period of two to three weeks before eruptions, the dome starts to, starts to swell up as new material comes inside. 
At that time, the rate is very changeable. From day to day, it, uh, it accelerates up to the point where just before an eruption, we've had movement as much as several meters per day, you know, outward growth of the dome. During the actual eruption then, when new lava is coming out of the dome onto the Earth's surface, we have uh, rates that are very slow by, by Hawaiian standards. Rates something on the order of uh, perhaps half a million or a million cubic meters of lava per day. And these eruptions last for a matter of several days, but normally the rate of eruption declines with time so that the, the total volume of new material during any one eruption is probably only about a million and a half or two million cubic meters. This plug is acting, this uh, is acting just like a plug, isn't it? It's just keeping all of that magma from I erupting. Now, what, what, what is going to cause that eventually to, uh, to break apart? Is it just the pressures of the gases build up below? That's very likely the uh, principal possible way to break the dome, yeah. And our studies so far show, or seem to show at least, that the magma reservoir that's supplying the, the dome is literally running out of gas. Uh, over time, the gases given off by the volcano have decreased. And detailed petrographic studies made of the rock itself shows that the amount of, of water in the system has declined with time also. So uh, I think unless we have an influx of new magma into the system that is gas rich, or unless for some reason the dome becomes a very sturdy plug that lasts for a long time, then we're unlikely to have any major explosions take place. But if either of those two possibilities were to occur, then we could have another explosion or another relatively large eruption like those of the summer of 1980, but not like May 18th. What about the uh, future, not only of Mount St. Helens, but of all of the uh, volcanoes along the Pacific Northwest, Hood, Adams, Shasta, Rainier, are, are these starting to show any kind of increased activity? No, they're not showing signs of increased activity now. Uh, Mount Baker in 1975 had an, uh, an episode of, of, of increased thermal emissions, which actually is still continuing more or less to the present day, but uh, we haven't been able to determine if magma was involved there or not. So on the short term, I, we, we certainly couldn't make the statement that any of these volcanoes are getting ready to erupt. We are, we are monitoring them, how, however, because in the long run, that is looking at, at centuries down the road, every volcano that you mentioned and more will probably erupt. And this probably is, is, one, is one of the major long-lasting effects of St. Helens. Uh, I think government authorities have come to the realization now that, that indeed volcanic activity is uh, something to be concerned about in the future. And w while there may be decades between eruptions, they will have the St. Helens experience to look back on once they're faced with, with such activity. One, one, act one very interesting situation now is in Long, Long Valley in, in California, near, mm -hmm. near Mammoth. And uh, that is a situation that has benefited, I think, quite a bit from the St. Helens experience. The situation is somewhat similar. There's a, this is taking place in a national forest, and so you have federal agencies involved, as, just as, as here. That's, so, that's, so that's a good example, I think, of how one situation can, has been able to benefit from what happened here. Dr. Thomas Cassetteval is one of the geologists who is monitoring the Mount St. Helens volcano. He explains what the scientists have learned from the numerous eruptions. Well, We've, we've learned a lot about ourselves, and we've learned a lot about volcanoes. Uh, but I guess you want me to talk about what we've learned about volcanoes. Um, Vol Mount St. Helens is the most intensively monitored uh, continental volcano, as opposed to an oceanic volcano like Hawaii. In Hawaii, they've had an observatory there for going on 75 years now. 
uh, St. Helens, the observations, the detailed day-to-day -day observations began in the spring of 19, 1980. In fact, today is the third anniversary of the day that I arrived in Vancouver from Hawaii to start studying Mount St. Helens. So we've had intensive observations here. We've had, I believe, 16 eruptions since May 18, 1980. And many of these eruptions have been repetitive in the sense that the, uh, approximately the same volume of lava comes out and the precursory patterns of seismicity and deformation and gas emissions um, are repeated uh, pretty faithfully from eruption to eruption. So this has allowed us to, to recognize some patterns or, or to establish some patterns and our ability to recognize them uh, has led to our ability to forecast or predict eruptions at Mount St. Helens. Um, I think we've learned a lot about how you monitor, or how you look at a volcano to, uh, to try to forecast what it's going to do. And we're applying some of those same methods to volcanoes in Indonesia and the volcano Pagan uh, in, the, in the Pacific. Um, other volcanoes in Central America where we're, we're realizing what sorts of rose-colored glasses we have to put on in order to look at a volcano and understand what it m might be capable of doing. So uh, that's probably the most important thing that will come out of the St. Helens experience. And in a, in a more philosophical sense, we've learned what sorts of information you need to gather over what sorts of time intervals uh, in order to predict natural phenomena in general. Uh, not just a volcano, but for example, earthquakes. Uh, people in the Geological Survey here in the United States, at universities in the United States, scientists overseas uh, are looking very carefully at the Mount St. Helens uh, experience because we have issued very accurate predictions as to, as to what we think is going to go on here. And they would like to apply a similar philosophy to trying to forecast things like, um, like floods and like earthquakes especially. So those are, those are some of the things that we're learning from Mount St. Helens experience. One of your specific uh, areas of interest is, I understand, the, the gas emissions. Right. Exactly how, what is the procedure that you use and so what? What, what, why, why is it important that we know that gases are, are emitted from a volcano? Okay, first of all, it's popularly believed that, that gases drive volcanic eruptions. Uh, the gas content of Hawaiian lavas is probably much higher than the gas content of a typical cascade stratovolcano in terms of the water and the carbon dioxide and the sulfur gas content. And it's popularly believed that that the gas content largely controls the eruptive style of a volcano. Um, so that's, that's a little bit as to why, we, why we're interested in gases. Gases are very fugitive. They can tend to leak out of small cracks and get to the surface quicker than magma can. So one of the ideas we have here is that uh, by looking at gas emissions and by looking at changes in the rates of gas emission, we might find some information suggesting what the next eruptive period is going to be. The way we make the measurements, we've been making them since late March of 1980, is uh, airborne measurements, that is flying in an airplane and measuring using remote sensing equipment, uh, measure sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, we use a correlation spectrometer for sulfur dioxide and basically this looks up at the blue sky background and if we fly under the plume we can look up and see how much light is absorbed due to the presence of sulfur dioxide molecules in the, in the path between the blue sky light source and the measuring instrument. For carbon dioxide we take the gas in continuously into a cell, into a chamber and we pass um, uh, infrared light through that and we look specifically at the absorption in one wavelength uh, in which infrared light is absorbed by a CO2 molecule. And we can do that and, and know what the concentration of carbon dioxide is mm -hmm. to uh, inhibit the transmission of, of infrared light. Um, we also make frequent collections of gas in the crater. 
from the from the cracks adjacent to the dome and on the dome itself. Um, and putting this whole story together, we've we've now got three years of data, and we can see trends, long-term trends and short-term trends to the emission patterns of the gases. And in several cases, this has been useful for forecasting eruptive behavior. And in terms of a long-term trend, getting back to the initial comment that gases drive eruptions, uh, we've seen that there's been a steady decrease in the emission rates of certain gases. And this decrease in emission rate has correlated quite well with uh, the style of eruptions. That is, in 1980, gas emissions were high and eruptions were explosive. 1981 and then 82, the eruptions have been non-explosive, gas emissions have been very low. So there's a correlation there and, and it's part of the science to try to determine what the relationship is between gas emissions, eruptive behavior, seismic behavior, deformation, the whole, whole package. So. What type of gases are generally coming out? <coughs> Typically, you have the most abundant gas in volcanic emissions is water. Mm -hmm. Here at St. Helens, water accounts for between 92 and 98 percent of the total gas emissions. That's called magmatic water. Well, that's a that's a point that we're that we debate, and uh, we think it's largely magmatic, but we know from certain measurements that it's that at least now it's uh, largely groundwater. Mm -hmm. Groundwater circulates into the volcano, gets heated up, and gets driven off and accompanies the other magmatic gases that come out. Uh, but the most important gas is water. Second most important is carbon dioxide, probably one or two percent carbon dioxide, probably one or two percent hydrogen gas, and then probably less than a percent uh, sulfur gases. So those are, the, those are the main important gases coming out from Mount St. Helens. I think back at the uh, beautiful films of the uh, May 18th eruption and uh, that tremendous amount, uh, that volume of ash just pouring out for mm -hmm. hours. Now, gases are driving all of these. Right. All right, yeah. so, so basically what has happened is there's been a tremendous amount of pressure mm -hmm. built up many, many hundreds of years, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, like opening up a bottle of soda pop, I would presume, That's right. this, That's right. this went. But you know, it, how, how long does this go until all of the uh, magma is, uh, has, has disappeared? Well, it goes until there's an equilibrium state reached, and that might require simply tapping off the top portion of the magma reservoir at a shallow depth mm -hmm. beneath the volcano. And we think that once the, once the initial um, gas-rich portion at the top of this reservoir is drained away, the things quiet down. And the reservoir reaches some sort of equilibrium state. It'll sit there, and as it sits there, it continues to crystallize, it continues to cool. Gas continues to separate out as you form crystals from the melt. When you form crystals, that, that, uh, that's, a, that's a volume in the magma chamber that no longer can hold the gas, so mm -hmm. the gas separates. Separates and tends probably to accumulate near the top of the reservoir. And when it gets to some critical pressure, it, uh, when it's built up to, to some certain pressure, it's, you'll trigger an eruption. And the gas might not be forming a, a separate gas phase like you would find inside a cylinder of gas. It could be like a sponge, like, like water in a sponge. And the gas is just kind of dispersed through the magma. And Dispersing gas through the magma will reduce the overall density of that portion of the magma where the gas is located. And personally, I think what drives a lot of volcanic eruptions is, is basically a, a, a material density contrast, an instability set up because you've got a portion of the magma reservoir that's less dense, less stable than another portion of the reservoir. So material starts to rise, sort of like hot air rising. Mm -hmm. And so it's this buoyancy contrast that, that gives rise to uh, the next batch of magma that's going to come out of the surface. And it's, it's largely, I think, gases that, that provide that, that density and stability. You segregate the gases into this portion of your sponge. They take up a certain amount of volume so that the density of the, of the bulk volume of the rock is decreased. And it's no longer in equilibrium with the rest of the reservoir, and it starts to rise. 
Compare this to Kilauea then, what's happening there? Uh, Kilauea is it's probably a similar process, but at Kilauea, the uh, lava is much more fluid for several reasons. One, it probably contains more gas. Two, it's a lower silica content, and it's the silica content of a rock which seems to control its viscosity or its, or its fluidity. And three, the temperature of Hawaiian lava is higher than St. Helens. So those three factors probably contribute to making Hawaiian eruptions much more fluid. When you get something that's much more fluid, it's, it's kind of like uh, water and molasses. Water can run through these very fine cracks very quickly, and molasses will just kind of flow slowly and not get out much more. Quickly. So in Hawaii, where we're having an eruption right now, things probably happen in a similar manner as they do at St. Helens. That is, you've got separation of a separate volatile phase, you've got magma supply from below that's more gas rich and it's hot and uh, it tends to want to get out of its confining area. But in Hawaii, things happen very quickly. Um, you might not see the same buildup in the deformation and size of the precursors that we do at St. Helens. Here we have several weeks advance notice that something's going on. In Hawaii, it might just be a few hours or two, at the most a few days. You can look at a longer term picture in Hawaii prior to interruption, you can see gradual deflation of an area or deflation of an area. Uh, but generally, I think things in Hawaii happen much more quickly. And it's because the lava is more fluid. But I think it's, it's, it's the same scenario going on. You've got something that's under great confining pressure. And if the pressure builds up within the magma chamber, it can overcome the confining pressure. Or if for some reason you suddenly reduce the confining pressure when there's a major earthquake. Material that's in there wants to expand and get just like hot air rising and you know, like shaking up a soda bottle and taking the top off. So why is there magma in the western part of the United States and not in the middle? Is there something uh, that we're doing wrong? <laughs> no, there's, there's a concept in geology that we call plate tectonics. And uh, there are basic premise of plate tectonics is that the that the surface of the Earth is broken up into a number of uh, plates that are fairly thin compared to their their lateral dimensions, and these plates consist of material of different density. For example, material in the oceanic plates is made up of basalt with a density of something greater than 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Material in, in the continental or lithospheric plates, or the, the uh, continental plates, is material of density 2.4, 2.5. So there's a, again, you've got this, you've got this contrast in specific gravity, and um, it turns out that the oceanic plates tend to tend to be in the low portions of the of the crust or the, uh, the Earth's lithosphere, and the continental plates tend to be in the high portions. But these plates are relatively mobile and free to move one with respect to the other. And it's these relative motions which generate probably a lot of frictional heating which cause melting of rocks and melting of rocks produce material that's more buoyant and this melted rock will tend to rise and uh, these form volcanoes. Now the places where the plates are in collision or coming in contact for example, the, the uh, west coast of the United States, west coast of South America, uh, the Aleutian Arc, Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, uh, Japan, the Philippines, all of those places occur at the, at the contacts between uh, plates that are in collision or convergent plate boundaries. And the oceanic plates typically ride under the continental plates. The more dense plate rides under the less dense plate. You get frictional heating, you generate magmas, magmas come up along these linear zones. And in the United States or in North America, this has its expression by the Rocky Mountain Belt. Uh, on the other hand, the interior of the continent is made up of, of what we call a stable cratonic region. It's older, um, more stable, less mobile parts of the, of the plate. It's kind of like, the, it's material that's kind of riding on the plate and uh, it doesn't really see a lot of the interactions that, that occur at the margins of the plate, but 
there there are earthquakes, for example, in the stable craton, and and so for sure the stable craton can sense the stress distribution or the stress readjustments that go along when plates are in collision. So I think it just points out that the that the surface of the Earth is a very dynamic place, and there are there are terrific thermal gradients in the Earth today, and these thermal gradients make the Earth uncomfortable, and it and it wants to. It wants to tend towards equilibrium, or it wants to work out these discomforts, and it does this by having plates abut against one another and, and generate magma and produce volcanoes. Thank you.